Well, good morning, church, and welcome to Alive Fellowship uh, Church. Now, one of the most significant principles you should practice in looking at the end of a project uh, while you are at the beginning of the project. It's one of the things that will really help you with the project is that at the beginning of it, you will look at it with the end in mind. Now, we practice this with, with little projects all the time. Uh, we take our car through the car wash because we have a clear picture of what we want it to look like when we get to the end of the car wash. And, and ladies, you are amazing at this when it comes to a big Thanksgiving Day uh, dinners. Before you even get started, you have this concept of how everything's going to look. You begin cooking, visualizing the dishes, preparing the turkey, what it's going to taste like before anyone ever uh, sits down. The teenagers visualize this kind of concept when they're graduating from high school halfway through their freshman year. They're starting to look with the end in mind. And that's what we're going to talk about as we work uh, through the last couple lessons in our end of the time study. There's a guy by the name of Steve Covey. He wrote a book set called The Seven Habit Habits of highly effective people. And one of those habits is to begin with the end in mind. And really, this is one of the benefits that God gave us through the book of Revelation and all end time prophecies. Here's the bottom line. Church, we win in the end. We win in the end. I believe Christians gain their greatest motivation to live by studying Bible prophecy. God wants us to know how everything is going to end. He clearly told us how everything got started. People who do not believe that they were created by God have very little value for life. In the book of Revelation and end time events can instill tremendous hope, confidence that no matter what the score reads right now, no matter what the scoreboard says right now, Jesus wins in the end. And that ought to bring us great, great peace and joy as we study end time events. So, how should we be living in our lives today knowing that we win in the end? So what I want to do today is I want to talk about uh, an end time event that is probably one of the least understood, but one of the most profound doctrines in all the New Testament. And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, we all understand that we only get one shot at this thing called life. There are no, there are no do-overs, there's no mulligans, no second chances. And because life is so short and it goes by faster than we think, we should begin with the end in mind. So here is the critical principle for us today. You and I will give an account of our Christian service to the Lord. One day this is going to happen. And so I want to talk about an end time event, an event that is coming. This event is called the Judgment Seat of Christ, and we could also call it the Bema Seat. So let's talk about the Judgment Seat of Christ. The Judgment Seat of Christ involves a time in the future when believers will give an account of themselves to Christ. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Now, I want you to understand that this warning is to Christians. This is not to unbelievers. So it's very important that you understand that. As Jesus taught in his parable, uh, the king is going to return, at which time he will require an account from his servants. The judgment seat of Christ is different from the great white throne judgment. You got the judgment seat of Christ, and you have the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment will be the final judgment of the wicked prior to them being cast into the lake of fire out of Revelation chapter 20. Appearing before the great white throne will be unbelievers. Will be unbelievers. Believers, if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ does not determine our salvation. That matter was settled by Christ's sacrifice on our behalf and our faith in Him. 
All of our sins are forgiven. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In John chapter 5, verse 24 says this, Very truly, uh, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So this judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, has nothing to do with salvation. Well, well why? Because the only saved people will be there. So it has nothing to do with salvation. Only saved people are going to be there. And here's how Romans says it in 14, 10. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So obviously, it, all believers are going to stand before God on the judgment seat of Christ. As a boy, I had this totally erroneous view concerning uh, this kind of subject about judgment. In my mind, I pictured kind of a heaven courtroom located somewhere beyond the stars, and, and all the people are there, and then there's a single file line in front of this throne. An angel would appear, and he would be carrying some scales, right? And each name would be called out. And they'd go, uh, John Jones, Austin, Texas, born 1925, died in 1985. Please step forward. And so as John stood there, all of his good works were placed on one side of the scales, and all of his bad stuff was placed on the other side of the scales. And if the good works outweighed the bad, then at much relief, John would enter into a door marked heaven. But if the reverse was true, poor John was de designated to a door marked hell. Now, of course, nothing could be further from the truth. There's this idea in the Christian community, community that everybody goes to heaven. That's just not true. And it really doesn't matter what you did or did not do to serve the Lord. We will all be treated and rewarded the same. So question is, is that true? Well, no, it's not true. You know, the Bible says God is a just God, which means he always does what is right, not what you and I think is fair. Now, we know that the Bible teaches there will be degrees of punishment in hell. Now, that makes sense uh, with the justice of God. So the question before us this morning that we want to talk about in this judgment seat of Christ is how will God reward us in heaven and what impact will that have on eternity? And so today I want to try to answer four uh, questions. I'm not going to so much talk about the rewards we're going to get. We're going to do that later. But today I want to truly answer four questions. Who's going to participate in this judgment seat of Christ? W when's it going to take place? Why is it going to happen? And then how do we prepare for it, right? Uh, so let's get started. Who will participate in this judgment? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let me read this for you. It says this, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put our heavenly bodies li uh, like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared for us this. And as a guarantee, he has given us the Holy Spirit. So we are always competent, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord, for we live by believing, not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident that we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we would be at home with the Lord. So Paul is talking about our earthly bodies and how we're going to receive heavenly bodies when we get to heaven. Now his focus is not on success in this life according to the world's standards. His focus is getting ready for a day that we will stand before Jesus and give an account. So how, how do we know that? Well, look at the next two verses. Therefore, because of all, everything we just said, therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. And then look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So that verse says that we must all appear. Church, you can't sit this one out. It's not an option. 
Uh, remember, this judgment is for believers, not unbelievers. All those who die without putting their saving faith in Jesus Christ will stand before, as I said, God, at the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment has got to be one of the most terrifying events in history when every person will stand one at a time before Jesus Christ and Jesus will re replay every opportunity, I believe, they had to respond to the truth of the gospel. How many Sundays, how many summer camps, every opportunity they had to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is at that time that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is who he said uh, he was. But it's going to be too late. Now look at what Philippians says in chapter 2. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above other names. Now look, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue could declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, let's go back to verse 10. For we must all appear, we're all on our own, at the judgment seat of Christ. And then it says that each one may receive. Notice Paul changes from the plural, we must all appear, to the singular, that each one may receive. You see, when you stand before Jesus, it will not be with your spouse or, or your best friend. Let, let me say it this way. The line that leads to standing before Jesus is a single file line. And by the way, do you know who's going to receive the strictest judgment? Those who teach God's word. James 3.1 Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. So the priority of every teacher should be to please Jesus, not to, to scratch the ears of those who are wanting to hear something. I heard once someone say that if you're trying to find the single file line at the judgment that goes the quickest, don't get behind the preacher's line. That one is going to take a lot longer. Eh, that's bad news for me. So if we're going to live with the end in mind, please understand one day, we are going to stand and look Jesus in the eye, and he's going to ask, what did you do with the time I gave you? What did you do with the opportunities that I gave you? Now, let's talk about when will the judgment seat of Christ take place. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says, So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns. For he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give each one whatever praise is due. And then in Revelation twenty two twelve, Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. Sometime after the rapture, every Christian will stand before God, uh, before Christ to be judged. And who's going to participate in this judgment? It's all believers. When will it take place? when Christ comes to take us home, sometime after the rapture. Why is this, why is it going to happen? What is the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ? Remember, the purpose is not to determine who goes to heaven. This is not a time to be judged on whether or not you're going to heaven or not. As I talked about, that is determined by what you do with salvation by grace through faith that Jesus Christ offers. John 3.18 says it this way, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And then in John 3, 36, and anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life, but, eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. To find the way, what is the purpose for the judgment seat of Christ? I want us to look at verse 10 in a little, verse 10 in a little more detail. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he was done, whether good or bad. Now please understand that when Jesus evaluates you and I, you will not give an account for your sins. Romans 8, 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. 
And the word bad in verse 10 carries with it uh, the idea of worthlessness. And this deals with the why behind what we did for Jesus. Did you serve him for the praise of men or for the praise of God? Did you just want to be seen? Uh, be seen? Was it a performance for somebody to pat you on the back? I want you to know something that, that 1 Corinthians says that God will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the heart. Remember, God is watching. I uh, read this story told of a group of children in a Catholic school cafeteria. At the beginning of the line, the Catholic nun had a sign in front of the bowl of apples that said, only take one apple, remember God is watching. Well, when the kids got to the end of the line, there was a plate of chocolate chip cookies. And one of the kids made another sign that said, take all the cookies you want, God's watching the apples. It, it is possible to serve uh, Jesus with an unpure motive. And a lot of people think, that, that I can only serve Jesus if I have pure motives. And the truth is, no one serves the Lord out of a perfectly pure motive and heart because the Bible says we all have deceitful hearts. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he did not judge himself. He said, I'm going to leave that to the Lord. And so we all want to do our best and hear someone say, good job. So it is your responsibility every time someone gives you a spiritual compliment to say thank you, and then remember in your heart to say thank you to the Lord for allowing you to do that, for allowing you to serve. Thank you for the gifts, the opportunities, the help to speak for you. And if the Holy Spirit uses it, He gets all the glory. But if you're only doing it for the praise of people, uh, you know that, and, and so does God. Now think about how humbling it will be when Jesus steps off the throne to thank you personally for serving Him. Now, the New, out, the New Testament outlines several rewards uh, that we're going to look at at a later date uh, of the rewards that we, uh, will, uh, will, we will get at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, one of the purposes of this judgment seat is to give us a greater uh, understanding of the opportunities to serve Him, especially, especially when you think about the thousand-year reign. You will give, be given a position during that time based on your faithfulness to Jesus, uh, according to Luke 19. I believe God is going to find something good to say about every Christian. But some Christians will indeed suffer a loss when they stand before Jesus. Look at 1 Corinthians 3.15. And this, this, is, this is a verse of hope. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss because the work is burned up. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Some Christians will make it to heaven because they trusted Jesus, but they did nothing to serve him. They never gave him any time, any of their talent, any of their money. And if they did, they, they wanted the recognition for it. Who will, who will participate? All believers. When will it take place? Sometime right after the rapture. Why is it going uh, to happen for us to gain rewards? And then lastly, how do we prepare for this event? Now, there are many, many things I could give you that God says you're going to be held accountable for. And let me just mention a couple. From the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 and in Luke 19, God makes it clear that He will hold us accountable for the spiritual gifts that He has given us. He will also hold us accountable for the natural talents that he has blessed us with. He will also hold us accountable for the opportunities that have come across our paths. God is going to evaluate our faithfulness to take advantage of the opportunities he uh, places before us. You have an opportunity to serve. You have an opportunity to, to witness, to lead somebody to Christ. And the second thing I would have you think about is how do you use your time? We all have the same amount of it, but we all don't use it equally. If you've ever been responsible for people working under you, you understand how frustrating it can be when people are, are lazy and don't use their time in the proper way. Ephesians 5, 15. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in the evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly but understand what the Lord wants you to do. And so let me challenge you to do one of two things with your time. Get up 30 minutes earlier and spend the first part of your day with the Lord, or maybe turn off your TV and read your Bible and pray before you go to bed.
Now, we know that either side of that takes discipline and commitment. But Jesus promised, if you draw near to him, he will draw close to you. He can, he, he can out-bless you and I any day of the week. Jesus' candy jar is so much bigger. So take, advantages, take advantage of the opportunities God gives you and become more disciplined with your time to study and pray. And so I've answered four questions about this very neglected but critical doctrine. And Jesus came and set an example for all of us that there is going to be a time. We win in the end, but we need to, to live knowing that we win in the end. And there is going to come a time where we're going to be examined about our willingness to serve people around us. Not whether or not we get into heaven, that's a great white throne judgment, but what we did with Christ. Yes, we're saved and we praise God for our faith and our salvation in Him, but now we have to work for Him. Remember, we're not competing against each other. We're all running this race together that is set before us. And so I hope and pray that you will begin to make changes in your life today, knowing that the judgment seat of Christ is coming. Father, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity for us to serve you and love you. Father, I thank you for everybody who's watching this video right now. That one of the end time events is the judgment seat of Christ, where we will stand before you and give an account for what we've done with what you've given us. Help us, Father, to be found faithful. In Christ's name, amen. Hey, God bless you, church. We love you very much. Hey, next week, we're going to be ending our end time study. Hope that you'll check with us, uh, check with us at that time. Have a great week.